Hey, it's Teresa. Before we get started with this episode, I wanted to quickly tell you how Anchor by Spotify helps storytellers. Honestly, if I hadn't found Anchor, I'm not sure I would have even started this podcast. For the last year or so, I've recorded, edited, and shared more than 50 episodes on all the major platforms using Anchor. I use the same equipment that I record audiobooks on as a narrator, but you could record and edit a podcast right from your phone or computer using Anchor. They have everything you need. And best of all, Anchor by Spotify is totally free. So, if you know someone who has a story to tell, an idea to share, let them know they can download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Okay, let's get on with the episode. Thank you for listening. This is a story about a seasoned war photojournalist named Annie Green. The timeline is 2015, and Annie is headed back to Afghanistan on assignment. She's struggling through PTSD from the last time she was there, when a girls' school she was working at exploded, killing her closest friend. She's also facing betrayal from a rival journalist, and she's navigating the delicate balance of love, motherhood, and a dangerous career. We're talking about Double Exposure, the thrilling fiction created by author Janae Sacken. Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. This podcast celebrates storytelling as essential. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, showcasing the talents of my author and narrator friends. I hope you'll hear an artist you love or find your next favorite wordsmith. So I was reading Nicole, you're in a home studio. Mm -hmm. This is Nicole Swanson. She's the voice of Annie Green, the narrator for Janae Sacken's series. We start the conversation with the author and her narrator with Nicole sharing how she works and how her work as a narrator is influenced by her other profession. So I'm still currently working as an occupational therapist, and I work in the Georgia Department of Corrections, the flagship prison hospital for Georgia. And I'm a bit of a unicorn. I'm the only OT in the Georgia Department of Corrections. <laughs> we have lots of physical therapists, but occupational therapists, it's just me. Um, I have to tell you, I've recently gained an assistant in Wesley, who is my facility dog. So my daughter is a puppy raiser for canine companions in her college program at University of Pittsburgh. And so she said, mom, you've got to get a facility dog for your practice. And so in February, I did. I went through this whole process of interviewing and visits and this application. And then I went for a two-week training and they matched me with Wesley. And um, it's been amazing. It's been amazing for me as a practitioner and my patient. I've had some patients tell me it's the first time they've pet a dog in 30 years because they've been incarcerated. Well, so how do you think that those experiences with people in that particular human condition informs how you perform your storytelling? Well, you know, it's very interesting. I've, I can't develop too close of a rapport with my patients because there's an element of danger there. But, but I am able to have some conversations. And especially now that I have Wesley, and he's kind of a bridge to kind of have a neutral conversation. Yeah, it, it kind of gives you an extra prism, more angles to look at than, you know, I mean, I, I grew up in suburban Augusta, Georgia, and I have this very relatively easy, clean, privileged life. But, you know, to to hear these other stories, you can kind of get different angles on what other people are dealing with. 
it's it's amazing. It's been super useful in my acting, but also just as a person, it's very interesting to understand some of the situations other people are going through. Having your life in that capacity as an occupational therapist, but then also having narration as something and acting and performing story, something you're doing part-time allows you the flexibility to choose your projects. And so I wonder what was it about Annie, the main character in Shanae's novels, what was it about that protagonist that you were attracted to? I love the fact that this book, aside from just Annie being a a badass, can I say that? (laughs) Yeah, you can. I totally agree. I think Annie's a badass. We can say that. (laughs) She absolutely is a badass. But also, I love to travel. I love adventure. I think just so much of who Annie is, is either who I want to be or who I want to lean towards. And that she's a good person, but, you know, she's just like the rest of us trying to make the best decision at the right time. Yeah. You know, the, the best she can do. When you're prepping the book, do you go through the characters and think about their character traits as you're giving them voice? Is that part of your process? Oh, absolutely. So I, I even have like all my little spreadsheet things. <laughs> so I have, you know, each character, you know, they each have a page, you know, any background information that's just written in the book that I can find where they're from or, you know, any descriptors. I look at their upbringing and where they're from and all of the little different elements that make up who they are. I mean, I've been acting for a long time since I was 10. So a lot of that character development, I just love that anyway. And I love to coach that. I have a couple of acting students that I coach. But I I just, I don't know. I guess I just like figuring out people. This time around, our producer, Craig, asked me to give Nicole a playlist. Okay, that new voice you just heard is author Janae Sacken, chiming in with a question for Nicole. She's talking about a music playlist that the audiobook producer, Craig Hart, suggested she create for her narrator. Our producer, Craig, asked me to give Nicole a playlist, which I did. And I'm interested in knowing how you use that. Um, Well, it's actually very funny because a lot of the songs you put on the playlist are on my personal playlists, (laughs) which was great. (laughs) I'm like, yeah, these are excellent songs. Being able to listen to it once in a while and just kind of get a feel for that I don't know. It, I related to it. So I didn't need to like play it while I was reading or anything like that. But um, just to take some time to enjoy it while I'm thinking about, you know, the characters. Was that a hard assignment, Janae? Was it a hard assignment to come up with a playlist? How did you do it? I went back and just channeled Annie. And once I did that, I knew exactly what had to be on the playlist. Mm hmm. And that assignment told me that when I had one of the um, author events, that it would be fun to have Afghan music playing as people arrived. And so one of the young guys at my publisher put together a Spotify playlist of Nasrat Parsa's music. And Nasrat Parsa was a Pashtun singer before he was assassinated. Um, and he is the one who sings the romantic song that Sorelli programs into Annie's satellite phone as the ringtone. In the author's note, you mentioned what your goal for writing the novel was. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. As I was writing Double Exposure, which is set in 2015, the elected Afghan government was in control. And so things were better for women and girls and men and boys. But as I was finishing the edits after August 15th, 2021, when the Taliban came back into power, I was having a real disjuncture in my own 
emotions and dealing with the actual real political situation. And I felt I needed to deal with that in some way. And so I knew, I mean, I knew from the beginning that the Taliban were going to shutter girls' schools, which is a focal point of both of these books is education for girls. Yes. And even though the Taliban were saying, oh, we have to study the Quran and see what the Quran says, I'm sitting in my little studio saying, we all know what the Quran says. I have multiple translations of the Quran. Nowhere does it say girls cannot go to school. Nowhere does it say that education for girls has to stop at grade six. What it says is that men and boys, women and girls should be lifelong learners. And it also says women and girls are the other half of men and boys. And anything that is true for men and boys is equally true for women and girls. So the Taliban took their time and waited an, almost a year until this spring to say um, education for girls above grade six would be illegal. Well, I've, it's so clear reading that you have a very deep knowledge about this region, the religion, um, the language. Like, I think it's, it's so carefully, thoughtfully presented. And I think, you know, in addition to this this conflict in this area and this region and this idea about education and, and women and their rights. To me, there's kind of a theme of, of interpreting code. Yeah. This poem that's really kind of a coded message. Mm -hmm. And you have multiple languages going on. And of course, language is code. And I think you've played with messaging and coding and communication in a really subtle way through this whole story. And I guess, where's the question, right? Um, the question maybe is for the narrator. So there were two different languages used in addition to English, and you had to learn how to pronounce all this. How did you, how did you prepare for giving that exactly the right intonation and inflection and emphasis? Uh, well, I have, um, I have a friend who worked, he was in the military in Afghanistan, and he worked with an interpreter there. Oh, wow. He connected the two of us. So I was able to have some conversations with him and he helped me with, with pronunciation. He, he was fantastic. But then I also ended up getting a Pimsleur course for Dari and Pashto and just to kind of get the words familiar enough in my mouth, my speaking. Yeah. I actually spent a little bit of time learning the basics of the language to, um, to just make it a little bit more natural. One of my favorite lines is when Annie says, your eyes are beautiful, and that this is a traditional Afghan way of deflecting a compliment. And I think that's such a universal thing that we're all so good at deflecting compliments. But that, I'd never heard that before. That's beautiful, isn't it? It really is. It's beautiful. Like, so where did you learn that, Shanae? Where did you pick that up? Um, I actually discovered your eyes are beautiful um, while I was writing Double Exposure. I had not heard that before. And could I just say that one of the things that I love most about Nicole's narration is the fluency with which she does the Dari and the Pashto. And there's not a hesitation. It just slides so smoothly. And it's just, it's a pleasure. It's just, it's joy to listen to. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. It was fun. The thing that did surprise me the most is how many sounds that are in Dari and Pashto that are, do not exist in English at all. And I like to think I'm pretty good at, at learning foreign words or accents. And, you know, I can look at it on the page and I can figure that out if I have a general knowledge of that language, you know. But um, let me tell you, 
I would be talking to the interpreter and he would say the word. I'm like, I don't see those sounds anywhere in this word. Like things that you would expect to sound a certain way sound completely different than those letters would be in English or any other romance language. Yeah, just fascinating. One of the things that kind of hovers in the background in this is PTSD. Sometimes Annie is is experiencing something in the book and the reader's not even sure if it's real. She's also interpreting her own kind of gut feelings, but she has these sort of moments of vivid memory and vivid experience that are so beautifully written. Where did that come from? Um, I have a fairly vivid imagination and my memories are very vivid. And I think I just tapped in to that. I also liked the idea of juxtaposing the PTSD and we're always in Annie's head. So you're right. We are never sure if something is actually happening or if it's Annie having an hallucination or a nightmare. Um, but I really wanted to juxtapose the voices, the experiences that are out of her control with some voices that are part of her everyday life. And that's the intuition that's speaking to her when her own inner voice is talking. And sometimes that sounds to her, it feels a little out of control, but um, for me, there was a real difference between when she's talking to herself and when she's having um, a PTSD moment. I think you played with that very well. And I think everyone can relate to having inner voice, mm -hmm. you know? So to me, it made the PTSD more relatable the way you wove those things kind of together, that it gave me an understanding of PTSD that I maybe didn't have before. Thanks. And the other inner voice she hears very often is Sorelli's. And I really, I liked the idea of using that as a way of deepening their relationship. Yes, because she is, he's, he's in her thoughts so much that she's imagining what he would say to her in this moment, how he would, and it does, it's exactly what you just said. It's a deepening of connection. I love that. One of the characters I loved writing is Gulshan, the English teacher who wears the burqa because she wants to wear the burqa. And she is incredibly independent and talented. And in her mind, wearing the burqa is her way of showing her faith. Um, she is dressing as modestly as she possibly can, and yet she is a dynamo. It's hard. I'm so glad you brought that up because she has some of my favorite lines, Gulshan. It's, it's interesting that she was such a, that she was a fun character for you to work on. So you give Gulshan this real strength of faith and character. And part of the reason I did that um, and, and have her wearing the burqa is that I think in the West, we feel that all women who wear full hijab are under the thumb of patriarchy and have no minds of their own and that they are all suffering. And some are, but there is a real strength that many of these women um, also have. And I, I wanted to get that across. I really loved that in reading the book, having that perspective, because like you said, we just don't, we just kind of make assumptions here, you know? Yeah, that was really meaningful to, to get that perspective, I think. Yes. For me, one of the ways you did that is, again, she has some of my favorite lines she tells her about this friend of theirs who's gone, who's died. Her footprints, her body will fade to dust. It is what happens to all of us one day. It is the way of all life. And this is a real, dust to dust is a real Judeo-Christian idea also, right? But to hear her say it 
there's you make a connection to her as a person as a uh, as a person of faith that maybe we don't we don't often make you know we don't see it we don't see the burqa wearing as this form of devotion we see it as you said as a form of um, oppression and it is for many women um you know my cultural and religious sensitivity reader the incomparable heba el kabaitri says the quran is explicit about not covering the eyes which are the windows to the world and not covering the hands which you need to pray and the burqa does both of those things and the burqa whether you look at it as a way of hiding women from the world of covering them so that men are not enticed or seduced as though that's the woman's fault or if it's um the burqa is the only way they can get out of the house and be not identified and so gain some independence to move around those are patriarchal yes and you 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 allow the reader to have that contradiction of thoughts and and evaluate it through Annie because I think she really even says that she talks about how she can see it as this form of freedom of movement within this patriarchy but that really what she respects about Kulshan is that she has the she has the freedom of choice right mm -hmm. like that's the real goal is that she choose this is what she chooses she does and Gulshan is married to a fairly liberal man who loves his wife. And this is also in 2015 when the burqa was not required. And especially in the Panjshir Valley, which is the most peaceful and um, I hesitate to use the word liberal, but it was a very peaceful area of Afghanistan and it was and still is ruled by the Masood family, and they are still actively um, rebelling against the Taliban. It's interesting how we, we're looking at it through the lens of today. We know what happens next. And yet there's still, there is a lot of hope in it for that time. You see how in 2015, there was hope. They're building the school. They're dealing with the pressures, but you you have you give us a sense of hope, but it is sort of bittersweet, isn't it? Knowing as a reader what happens next. One of the things that happens is stateside too. You have a section of the book where we're in Milwaukee, um, Annie's daughters in Milwaukee, and we have you kind of thread these plot lines together of what's going on here. But what I really liked of the action that takes place in Milwaukee is that there's a there's fundraising going on. There there are young girls here, Americans who are working together to fundraise to rebuild the school in Afghanistan. And why, why did you include that part of it? What did that, why was that meaningful for you? We have a, um, a vibrant Muslim community in Milwaukee. There are a number of mosques here. I was driving along Lake Drive, um, right by the lake, lake Michigan. And I saw this group of women and girls all wearing headscarves. Some of them were wearing raincoats down to their ankles. Some of them were just in shalwar kameez. Um, and one was holding up a sign saying, meet a Muslim, and they were all holding flowers. And if you went up and met them and said, hello, they'd give you a flower. And so I, as I saw this, and it was right opposite my favorite coffee shop, Colectivo on the lake, and I said, that's going in the book. And this is when I was just launching behind the lens. And so I was starting double exposure. And I said, this is going in the book. Let's pause right there and listen to some of the book. What you're going to hear is from the beginning of the book. We're in Washington, D.C. with Annie. She's just returned from an assignment and she's stepping into a meeting that she's not prepared for. This is from Double Exposure by Janae Sacken, narrated by Nicole Swanson. Door open, I slip inside. Kevin was right. 
Besides Chris, there are two VPs I've gone drinking with a few times, the Director of Human Resources, and a gray business-suited man I've never seen before, all seated around the long rectangular conference table. Every last one of them looks solemn. Grim might be more accurate. There's one empty chair at the end of the table. Sorry, I mutter, sitting down as unobtrusively as possible. Yemen, Qatar, just landed, Dulles. Chris nods curtly, as if this makes all the sense in the world. Actually, in the news business, we all understand this kind of shorthand. Foreign correspondents are always coming in from or going off to somewhere. Damn, he looks upset. His hands are resting on the table, clenched so tightly his knuckles are white. The tiny black hairs on the back of his fingers are standing on end. Glad you could finally join us. He coughs out the words. You know everyone here, except for Marcus Johnson. I start to smile hello when Chris adds, Marcus is a member of our legal team. My smile falters. Everyone's back to looking at me. Might be nice if they clued me in. Instead, they let me squirm for a full minute. Brutal. Finally, Chris clears his throat and unclasps his hands, placing them flat on the table. A situation has been brought to our attention. A situation? I look up sharply and see the concern etched across his face. Obviously, he's waiting for me to speak. To explain. I don't understand. The impeccably dressed HR director leans forward. Just so we're following protocol, Annie, would you like to have a personal representative present? All I can do is stare at the woman's small gold hoop earrings. I'm caked in dry sweat and completely exhausted. My brain isn't functioning well enough to process what a personal representative is, much less why I might want one here and now, other than something bad is about to come down. Totally bewildered, I shrug. You tell me. Annie, this has to do with your trip to Afghanistan last May. Chris looks down at his hands. It's serious. He points toward the video monitor, which I notice for the first time is front and center for easy entertainment viewing. Something tells me what we're about to see won't be all that entertaining, especially for me. Time to get my act together. Slapping my palms flat on the table, I lean forward and do my best to keep my voice steady, controlled. I've just gotten off a 14-hour flight from Qatar. Before that, I was in Yemen for a month, which is the equivalent of a hellhole for those of you who haven't been there. Which means everyone in the room except me. A dig I probably shouldn't have allowed myself. And Saudi for eight weeks before that. So no, I have no idea what any of this is about. Chris slides off his glasses and pinches the bridge of his nose. Oh... This is really bad. The last time I saw that move was just before he told the crew about our former producer's death by sniper fire in Kabul. Oh, fuck. Who now? Before I can carry that thought any further, Chris picks up the remote and clicks on the monitor. Instantly, a wide-eyed woman's face fills the screen. She looks drawn hollowed empty by a horror she won't be able to comprehend for a long time. Maybe not ever. Her wild red curls are escaping from under her black hijab. There's no mistaking who she is. Get away from me! She yells, two-handing a semi-automatic handgun, pointing it first at the camera, then at someone off-screen. There's a bobble in the video feed as if the cameraman scrambled to get out of the line of fire. The film keeps rolling. A second woman, a reporter from another cable news network, mic in hand, steps into the frame. The intrepid Pierre McNeil from Al Shabakat. What about her daughter? Her voice is gentle, 
her tone oozing concern. Not exactly the way I remember it. Her mic is right in the face of the red-haired woman, so close it could knock out a few teeth. Seema, right? Where is she? Was she killed in the fire? I stare at her lips, slightly out of sync with her voice. On the TV monitor, thick smoke envelops the two women, all but screening them from view, and a blast erupts off camera. Probably one of the kerosene containers stored in the Wedcall Secondary School for Girls, which is fiercely burning. Flames shoot high above the building, completely engulfing it. The smoke clears, and the charred remains of a once white Toyota pickup are just visible, embedded in the front classroom. Off to one side, Tariq Gafour kneels next to the body of his wife, Daria Faludi. My best friend. Women in black burkas and headscarves cluster together, a respectful distance away, waiting to put Dar's body into the flatbed of the waiting truck. Another kerosene container explodes. Next to me, the vice president for digital coverage jumps in his seat. He clears his throat nervously, a sure sign he hasn't been in a war zone any time recently, if ever. Back on the screen, a man's arm clad in a nubby sports jacket wraps around the gun-toting woman from behind, ready to pull her out of the shot, or to keep her from shooting. But not before the red-haired woman speaks again, her voice bordering on hysterical, her hands tightening on the pistol grip. Try me! Wait. Didn't Pierre say something else before I pulled the gun out of my pack? I try hard to reconstruct what happened, but come up blank. Piera finally sees the gun and smiles. Such an oddly self-satisfied smile. Another bobble in the video feed. Then the screen fades to black. On my other side, the VP for news exhales a sigh of relief, as if she's worried the red-haired woman might actually have shot Piera, as if she doesn't know what happened next which is pretty disingenuous, given that I'm sure everyone in this room has watched the video clip at least a dozen times. Everyone, that is, except me. This is my first time seeing the video. But I lived it. I'm the woman training the gun on Piera McNeil. We're going to jump back into the conversation now. We're just talking about Annie's daughter, Mel, and the storyline in Milwaukee, where Mel works with a local mosque to raise money to rebuild the secondary school in Afghanistan. And Mel tells the Fakiris what happens to the school in the first book, and they decide together that doing some sort of a fundraiser would be something that they could do. It also gives me a reason to send Annie back to Wad Cole and a big portion of the second third of the book is about rebuilding the school and all that is involved in that, the kinds of blockades that people put up, the um, support that rebuilding the school and having a school for girls has or not in the village. And um, so part of it was a plot point, but part of it was also to um, make Mel a more prominent character, which she was insisting on. For you, the author, she said, give me more space in this book. <laughs> oh yeah, I hear from these characters all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it doesn't surprise me that you were drawing from some real life experience because it feels very much like this could happen, especially um, having a daughter of my own and knowing how, how open her mind is to global things. Uh, really, you know, I just think I, I, I'm hopeful, right? When I but I meet high schoolers and young college students who feel like we should do something. We could get in, we could make a difference. We could get involved. And so you allow us to sort of experience that through Mel. I think this younger generation, especially when you juxtapose it with 
the pushback that she receives from her father and the generation a little older about what are you doing and don't interact and that's dangerous and I don't want you involved with those people. You give us both sides of that and when we're in Milwaukee, we get to see that there's this hopefulness mm -hmm. in youth really, but there is also still pushback that it's not an easy thing to accomplish. Well, and there was also a story um, which is touched on in Double Exposure about a girl who was in an area high school. And she was your typical white upper middle class teenage girl. And she fell for a fairly conservative um, Muslim guy in her school. And he was pushing the boundaries toward the Taliban and even ISIS. And she fell hard for him and came home one day wearing a burqa. Yeah, I think you play with that in a couple of different ways in the story, how we are susceptible to extremism, how that can be an attractive thing, um, especially in romantic relationships that people are persuaded by romance sometimes to do, to go in a direction that they wouldn't necessarily have gone in. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about Mel? Nicole, did you like seeing more of her in this book? Did you enjoy her as a character, her storyline? Absolutely. I live with three Mills. Like <laughs> they're they're all off at college now, but I have three daughters. So very relatable the the way that they interact. I, you know, I think that Annie and Mel are are close, and my daughters and I are close, you know, despite any um the normal teenage stuff. But yeah, I agree with what you were saying. It's that hopefulness that comes with youth, you know, ready to take on the world and make good positive changes. And um, so for me, Annie and Mel's relationship is a very easy one because I kind of, you know, I, I have that experience with my own daughters and, you know, I kind of get in their head a little bit. So I, I enjoy having Mel in the book. Yeah, it's another, it's another great relationship. And I think it's fleshed out really well. I, I believe Mel is the age she is, that she's experiencing the things she is. I think you do a really good job. Have you taught that age, Janae? Is, or are you mostly, you're, you've been in college level, haven't you? Yeah, I have only taught college level. So the youngest I have taught 17, 18, and I don't have children. So I, um, I channeled a lot of the teenage daughters of friends of mine and my own teenage self. Yes, I actually did wonder that. I wondered if Mel was maybe a version of you. Yep. That there were parts of you there. But I think all writers do that, put something of themselves into one or more of their characters. Yes. And well, clearly, because you, you are a consummate photographer and have been recognized for your photography, that that plays into who Annie is. That's, that's the other thing about sort of intuition that I love about this is that she has these moments where the hairs stand up on her neck or she has like a vibration almost where she knows she's about to capture a really amazing shot through the camera lens. I wonder if that's something you experience. Yeah, um, I started in photography back when we shot film. And often you would you know, you're doing everything you're supposed to do to set up the shot, but you really don't know what you have until you get home and you're in post-production, which is difficult when you go to some of the far off places that I go to, because you can't just easily set up the shot again. And um, in some ways, I'm an intuitive photographer. And so I got to the point where I literally, my fingers tingle when I know I have got the shot. Do you experience that all, Nicole, in performing? Do you ever get a moment where you go, oh, that? Oh, yeah. Where you just, you just get that. I don't know how to describe it. Just that sense that you're riding the wave exactly the way you should be. That's a great analogy. You're riding a wave. Yeah, I think you feel when you're in really sync up with, with the words on the page and it, it, it's coming through you, not from you. 
Yeah, yeah. I have that same thing with writing. Mm. I And I can actually, this is going to sound pretty Twilight Zone-ish, but I can feel when I'm really in the zone, words going through my fingers to the keyboard. Um, it's It's a transcendent moment. And you just feel like you're channeling it. Yeah. One of the transcendent moments in the book is a dance. Yeah. How did you prepare for writing those scenes? I, I honestly don't remember how I first learned about the Atan, but it's actually in the first book um, as well. Yeah. Had you heard of it before, Nicole? Had you ever heard of it? No, I hadn't. No. It used to be a war dance. It was a Pashtun war dance back hundreds of years ago. And it has since become the national dance of Afghanistan. And it is the dance that is often done at engagement parties or at wedding parties. So to go from being a war dance where that hand was twirling um, headscarves over their heads as rallying for war um, to now having that hand become casting flowers. That's amazing. It is amazing. It's just another example, though, of how you have interwoven cultural things that the reader might not be familiar with, but then experiences through reading it, you know, has a, has a different kind of appreciation of something they never knew before. It's really eye-opening. Yeah. It's educational. It's eye-opening. It's, um, it's fascinating. I mean, I enjoy learning about other cultures. That's, you know, I'm a discovery kind of gal, but the attention and the care to all the details and it's, you don't, it's not like you're hitting the reader over the head or the listener over the head with this is the Atan and you know, this is what, you know, it's, it's so interwoven into the story and so natural that we pick up on all of this information and all of these. And one of the things I have to say is um, the food, describing the food. I, I, I have a recipe for shakshuka now that I make on occasion. I mean, I, I just love it. And it's so detailed that you can taste it when you're when you're reading it. So you've done a really, really beautiful job of of immersing, I think, the reader or the listener into the the culture and letting them have that experience. Oh, that is so kind of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was, and this comes up early in the book, but you make reference to a sculpture. Annie's coming back, I think, into D.C., and you reference a sculpture. Can you talk a little bit about that sculpture and why it's important to you? Um, yeah, it's a, um, a huge sculpture of um, Pinocchio in an airport terminal in um, the Middle East. And I, um, this was my attempt to be a literary scholar. I have my PhD in comparative literature and um, from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And um, one of the things that I loved in that other lifetime was finding an image in a book that is the coalescing point for a number of themes that come together. And so this is a sculpture of Pinocchio, a moment before Geppetto brings him to life. And the sculpture is called The Liar. I wanted to have it reflect the interaction between Annie and Piera McNeil, also called the Piranha, which focuses around what is the truth, um, the truth between Sima and Awalmir, um, the truth between Catherine Elizabeth and Mel, and the truth between Annie and Sorelli. 
which I have to tell you, um, I mean, there is a surprise that happens between Annie and Sorelli. And I got a, a phone call from my editor one day and she said, how could you do this to me? <laughs> and I said, oh, I guess you got to page 100. <laughs> um, so there is a truth that goes on there. And um, I mean, there, there's a lot of playing with truth and lie or what's the reality of a situation. And so I think even when you are just in Annie's head, what is really going on? And what is the truth of any given situation? And then of course, there's also Bibi and Omar and all of those Londays. Yes, the Londay, the coded messages, right? Getting to what's truth and what's not truth. I think that the line that I wrote down about Pinocchio was, Annie says, I've always liked the idea of an artist being able to make artwork real, to have that kind of impact. That is really part of you as a storyteller. You are having an impact, right? Breathing life into something maybe that we haven't seen before. That's what artists do. Um, and I think Annie does that with her photography and um, I hope I do that with her books. And can I also say that's exactly what Nicole does with the narration. I think she really brings these books to life. Thank you. Your eyes are beautiful. <laughs> Deflecting the compliment. I love that. I love that. You're brilliant. <laughs> okay. Well, so um, the name of the podcast is Desideratum, which means the desire for essential things. It's a Latin word. And so for me, storytelling is essential, but I always like to ask, and I've asked Janae this in the past, but I thought I'd ask you today, Nicole, for you, if you had to tell somebody, these things are essential. This is essential to me. What would you say? Oh, gosh. Um... Improv. <laughs> um, uh, things that are essential to me is an openness to understand others and the world around you. That's essential to me. That's a beautiful answer. And so appropriate for this story. Really. I love that. If you would like to hear more of Nicole performing the Annie Green series, Beyond the Lens, and Double Exposure. Please look for them on Libro FM. When you use the affiliate link to Libro FM, you support this podcast. And with Libro FM, you can choose a local bookstore in your neighborhood to support as well. You can find the Libro FM affiliate link on my website and all my social media bios. I would like to thank Janae's publisher, 1016, for connecting me, and producer Craig Hart at the audiobook publisher Northern Lake Audio for connecting me to Nicole and providing the extended and excellent audiobook excerpt for this episode. I'll link to all of their websites in the show notes. As always, thank you for being here, and thanks for listening. <laughs>